I'm really honoured to have you here. And I think that it's a really important point to say you're my second guest on this incredible Yinyamurra. Um, and how do you actually feel now that you're just landed in Canberra and you've come from Sydney, but you actually live in Darwin? I'm tired, <laughs> but I'm really excited because I haven't been in Canberra for many years, but I have a lot of childhood memories here. So I feel really um, lucky to be here, especially during all the COVID times as well. So being able to travel here is very special. Yeah, it's exciting. So really, um, Darwin is home for a lot of reasons, isn't it? Yes. It's your country. Yes. So I'm a Larrakia woman, a Dungalaba woman, which Dungalaba is saltwater crocodile. Um, and so I'm from the Gulumbringan tribe and the whole area of Darwin and the greater region of Darwin is my country as well as the Tiwi Islands and out to Wadda, which is west of the Northern Territory and even east in the Northern Territory in Nuka. So yeah, a lot of family and a lot of cultural connections to a lot of places, but Darwin is my main home at the moment. It's my grandmother's country. Your grandmother's country, but you've got a really important role model in your life with your dad. Yes, so that's my um, dad's mother, is my grandmother. And yeah, my dad is a very important person in my life and has, I was just FaceTiming him <laughs> before this interview. And we actually watched the Lydia Thorpe interview together back at our family home um, in Lar on Larrakia country. So okay. it's all very full circle, but yeah, my dad, it's very important to me. Yeah, that's great. And, and what's that feeling of when you're actually on your own country? How do you think that really makes, especially young people, feel empowered, for example? Yeah, I um, have often thought about how to explain the importance of country, especially to non-Indigenous people, because I don't think we actually have words in the English dictionary that explain how it feels to be on our country. So but it is the feeling of being hugged by a loved one or complete peace or when you had a really good sleep or when you experience pure joy. All of those things are what I feel when I'm on my country, even on the worst days, even when things are really heavy and when life in the colony is really hard. Me being on my country, there's this little flame of, um, I guess, like strength that keeps going, that keeps me going. And I remember my parents telling me that as a baby, when, I, when we moved from Darwin to Newcastle, um, the weeks leading up to before we flew out, when I was three years old, they noticed that I got really depressed as a three-year-old because I knew that we were leaving my country and that even when we landed, I was sad for a period of time. And it was the first time they'd ever seen me sad as a child and it was because I was taken from my country. And that was with my parents and um, in a loving home and everything just to move to another place. But that just shows you the... Um, devastation that comes from being off your country. Exactly, and and really when you think of a lot of young people now, they, they're told that they should get an education, they should move to the big cities, um, so it's a really urbanised environment, but you've just said that when you're off country, this is how I feel. So how does that really, um, and, and what does that mean mm. for a lot of young people that want to get in that fast lane? I mean, the cool thing is, is like you can do whatever you want to do. Like if you want to become a fashion designer or an actor or a dancer and you don't have those opportunities on your own country, then absolutely follow your dreams and go and do that. But don't feel forced to do that because that's actually just the white man's indoctrination and that's actually the colony speaking being like to be successful you have to have a corporate job and never ever sleep and never ever see your family but you can drive a flash car and live in a flash house and you can like go play golf or like go and um, play sport on the weekends or whatever like there's this really formulaic lifestyle that's sort of well that is advertised all the time by the colony um, but really 
when Aboriginal people come back into ourselves and when we go back to our own country and go back into the simpler things in life, like being on country, being with family, healing ourselves, going out camping, going out hunting, that's where we get our strength and that's where we actually find our version of success. So having been someone who did go away to boarding school or did go away to university off country, that served amazing purposes and served amazing connections and networks, but it's not everything. And at the end of the day, that ended up damaging my spirit and making me really depressed and unwell. So I ended up having to move back to my country. And fortunately for me, I have a university on my country and I have job opportunities on my country. So in some ways that is a privilege that I can do that and still participate in the things that the white man deemed to be successful. But I know that um, for my version of happiness and joy that I just have to be on my country. So. I think that's the most important thing that young Aboriginal people need to know. And so how do you then end up at law school? What sort of compels someone to go, I'm really comfortable on country, yeah. but now I'm going to take on one of the toughest degrees yeah. in, as I know myself, really um, yeah. not very comfortable um, when you're actually going into that mm. space. How and why? Well, my mum's a teacher and has grown me up reading and being really curious and into literature and speaking my mind and I guess my natural predisposition is to be quite educated as well. And so being surrounded by education and learning and being a high achieving student throughout primary school and high school, it was sort of a natural thing to be like, well, I'm gonna get a really good ATAR and I'm gonna to go to university, I'm gonna study law. And especially cause we get these messaging of like, be this Aboriginal woman who studies law. Like you've already done the private school thing. You've already excelled in all of these things. So you may as well get a law degree too, because that's sort of what the dream Aboriginal woman in the colony does in some ways. Like buying a new suit. Yeah. yeah. And so that was sort of the thing to do. And the school that I was at, the private school I was at, they're like, yeah, go into law school. And it seemed sort of the only option for me. And I knew that I was a good advocate and I was really passionate about fighting for my people. I've always had that and have always looked up to people like Martin Luther King or Malcolm X. So I knew this understanding of justice and understanding the white man's law. So on the one hand, it was pressures of expectations as a high achieving student to be like, you should probably study law. But on the other hand, I knew that I'd learn really, really useful skills that would then <clears throat> allow me to demolish white supremacy. <laughs> so hence the t-shirt. Yes. So Barker. could you explain that to us? Um, well, first of all, I love Barker and she's a staunch black woman and a rapper. And I just got it delivered up to Darwin last week and Barker is holding her fist in the air and just recently my cousin and I and two of our friends were arrested for doing this in Parliament House in Darwin. So what happened? Um, we were, pro so my cousin Shana Ali and I are the co-founders of Uprising of the People which is an organisation that leads protests in Darwin and we led a protest against the Northern Territory's Youth Justice Amendment Bill, which wanted to see more Aboriginal kids locked up, basically. So the bill wanted more monitoring, ankle monitoring bracelets for young kids, breath testing for young kids, um, harsher bail laws, which means that it's harder for repeat offenders to get bail, which means more kids locked up in Dondale. Um, and also when we're talking about kids, we're talking about 10 year olds to 17 year olds, um, which is just disgusting. So we were protesting against that. So we went to sit in on parliament while they were passing this bill and giving their speeches. And we stood up with our fence, our fists clenched silently like this and were asked to leave and then we didn't. And then we got charged with disorderly behaviour and non-compliance with security orders. And that's on your own country? That's on our own country. In a public, like also in our own country, so sov as sovereign people, we should be allowed 
in certain spaces. But then as an Australian citizen, that's the house of the people, that's the house of democracy. And we were silenced in that house, but also as Larrakia women on Larrakia country. And now we have a trespass notice as well on our own country. So that means you're going to court and have, having to say why you actually wanted to be on your country quietly protesting mm -hmm. um, for justice yep. issues. And what message does that send to young people, especially you know, Indigenous youth, Aboriginal youth? It says don't even try because you'll end up locked up anyway. It, we were fighting against young people being incarcerated only for ourselves to end up in custody. It just teaches young people to be fearful of the system that we're already terrified of and um, to not even bother because even if you're silent and gentle and a young, like... Martin Luther King, person. I mean, he was a gentle yeah. man. Yeah, you and still be arrested or killed. So there's no right way to do justice in the colony because even if you do as they say and be quiet, they still will arrest you or incarcerate you or um, humiliate you. So what is the whole meaning for protest? You know, wh why is it so important we, in human rights, for example? Can you explain a bit more about that? Just on a personal level, like if you and I, if I said something to you and it was mean or if it upset you, you should be able to hold me to account and say, hey, Maluma, like that wasn't cool, that made me feel this type of way, can you please not do that again or can we work out something that would be better so we both feel safe? That's the plain and simple thing of human rights and of protest. It's you being able to express that this wasn't okay, it didn't make you feel safe, can we negotiate and work out something better that will be beneficial for both of us? And that's what protesting is, but on a bigger scale. Protests with more people are just showing all the people that have this same idea of humanity and this same idea of genuine peace and justice for people all coming together. Um, protesting is so important, it's how we've gotten every single rights already in history to date. Um, by people standing up and saying, you know what, that's not cool. <laughs> you shouldn't be doing this, this is not okay, here's the reasons why, and here are some suggestions, even though we shouldn't even have to suggest the other ways, but that's what we end up doing. Um, protesting needs to happen, there needs to be freedom of political communication. There can't just be one way of doing things, we have to constantly be learning from each other and constantly be holding each other accountable. I always want to be held accountable. If I do something that offends someone or that I could potentially do better, I want to know because we can always be improving on ourselves and always be working to look after one another. And protesting the physical movement of marching down the street is so empowering to people. When you see little kids, little black kids walking with their flag shirts and they're smiling up and they're looking at all the flags and banners and they're screaming out, always was, always will be, and they're feeling proud. That physical movement of people coming together and marching down the street, like we know we're not supposed to walk on the road, so that feels cool because you're like, yeah, I'm a, re a rebel. But then when you're with people that you love or people that support you and you're marching down the street and you're with hundreds or thousands of other people, you're like, oh, cool, I'm a part of something. And we're doing something, there's a movement here. And that physical movement manifests itself into psychological movements and cultural shifts. So, so yeah. do you think a cultural shift um, is going to happen from reconciliation and having one day in one year? We can't say no in that every tiny little bit helps. I personally don't believe in reconciliation because to reconcile is two people coming together or two parties or more than that coming together to meet in the middle or that which I don't believe Aboriginal people have to come up or down to meet anywhere because we're not in the wrong, which we're constantly told we are, but we're actually not. Um, however, the idea of healing and truth telling is absolutely important. Um, obviously, Reconciliation Week serves its purpose and it's symb symbolic and allows for conversations to happen. And that's always important. There's never a movement within the Aboriginal rights movement that isn't gonna help. Every little bit will help but there were some things that I will align to more than others. Um, and 
reconciliation as a concept is something I'm not really aligned with, but I love the idea of truth telling and healing and mainly self-determination and allowing my people to have our own power and our own autonomy to have control over our lives. And I think that the main thing that I really want to find out uh, on this amazing insight that you've given us is where does your joy come from? Yeah, um, from the simple things from the sunshine <laughs> to sitting on my country at the beach, feeling the salt water, around my toes and my legs because we don't go swimming in the territory because of crocodiles. <laughs> we don't want to be taken. No, that's good. Um, and being with my nieces and nephews, um, being with my dad, hearing the wind brushing through the trees. My joy comes from all those little things which I can have without anything else, just my people and my country and the laughter that I share with my sisters is so important. That relationship between black women is just something that's unbreakable and is the ever burning flame that keeps our community alive is the laughter and joy of black women. And I'm really honored and grateful to have beautiful sisters in my life my big sisters and my little sisters who are always there for me and we're always building each other up and they are my constant source of joy. So there's a lot of hope for the next generation? We have to have hope. There's um, Hope has to come in all the smallest forms or even the biggest forms, but there is a lot of hope out there and um, it just sprinkles itself really gently through everywhere. And um, the cool thing is, is that not everyone's always going to be having a bad day. Someone will always be having a good day. So it's really beautiful when you're having a bad day to look and see someone else that's smiling and be like, OK, yep, that's a little bit of hope I needed to keep going. Or the sun shining today, good, that's a little bit of hope I needed to keep going. Or maybe it's raining. Some people love the rain. I do in the wet season. So maybe that's the symbol of hope. So it comes in all different ways. And as Aboriginal people, we know that our ancestors are with us all the time and sending us messages through different forms of nature. So when we actually look around, we know that there's hope everywhere, but we just have to be open to it. And, and you've been open to a lot of things, and especially when you've finished law, yeah. um, there's going to be a whole lot of things for you to do, I guess. Yeah. You're going to be busy? Yes, <laughs> flat out. Although I might just... My dream is to just get a um, dual cab Land Cruiser and just go camping for a long time and just live out in the bush. That would be my dream for when I finish my law degree and just go spend time on my country and learn my language and things like that. And then I can come back and deal with the colony at a later time. Yeah. <laughs> They'll still be there. You They'll know still that. be there. So <laughs> that's why I need to conserve myself. But yeah, yeah, yeah um, that's amazing. lots to look forward to. Yeah, and you'll also, like a, a lot of us, will have to change around tires and yes. bring food and, yes. and just and really take photos. I mean, yeah. I really hope you do that and you can share those with I'm us. I'm excited. Maybe lots of filmmaking, I think. Oh, yes. that would be amazing. Yeah. And um, definitely photos. I have to start an Instagram account, probably. I think that's probably the next yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. But you've got a few years to go yet, right? Yeah. I'll worry about that later. But... <laughs> Um, yeah, for now, just trying to chip away at the law degree. Um, it helps seeing women like you who've already been there and done that and can say, just study, just do the readings. That's um, it. And, and just do it till the end. Because it, 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 I really sort of had to clench my teeth and do that final year. And I didn't finish year 12, which I'm very proud of you. You've actually done that. Thank you. Um, but yeah, that joy is, is amazing. And we'll take that on, you know, and in our hearts from, you know, that expression. And, and I think everybody needs joy. Mm -hmm. and, and we hope today, you know, having that chat and really seeing what's important in life is, is really going to make people also around listening to this um, a little bit lighter, mm. a little bit more hope, yeah. and just to hold on to that joy. And thanks so much for doing um, this amazing interview and it just feels just so natural and it's just an honour to have you. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> Pleasure. Yeah. Yeah.